Um, but let's move on to lecture 14. Um, so now we're going to talk about, let's call it applications. Uh, basically, this is external forced convection correlations and sort of how you deal with correlations. Um, well, we just talked about all this stuff, so I'm not going to recap it, but uh, it's there if you want to look at it in the future. Okay, um, so we have this question of, we have approximate solutions, we have these correlations, what's the difference between them and when should I use an approximate? So remember, like approximate would be something like H at X is equal to K over delta T, right? Uh, you're, you're approximating your heat transfer coefficient by saying I'm gonna take the ratio of the conductivity to the boundary layer thickness. That's an approximate model, it's a conceptual model. It has a lot of assumptions baked into it. When we wanna do a really accurate model, we would not use that. We would use a correlation that evaluates new salt and then we relate the new salt to the heat transfer coefficient. So when, when do we wanna use an approximation? Well, first, I think it helps to think about what the approximation assumptions were. So now that we've had a little bit of time to think about convection and think about what's happening, um, let's step back and then kind of remember where we came from here. So what makes the solution approximate, first of all? What makes, what makes the solution approximate for this delta T model? Uh, well, we said the delta T is, uh, we're using this analogy of a thermal wave that's conducting through a semi-infinite wall. So a semi-infinite wall involves a solid medium that's not moving and you have heat that's moving into that, that medium. Well, that's sort of like what's happening here, but it's not quite because you have fluid moving. So how does the fluid moving kind of change the, the picture? Well, okay, we, we sort of approximate it as saying, I've got some slug of fluid, this, this blue one here, this little differentially small slug of fluid that's at a higher temperature and all of a sudden you start getting heat that's sort of conducting in, and then you let it uh, slide over a little bit more and more heat conducts in, more and, and so on. And this kind of thermal wave grows into this little differential slug of fluid. So the approximation there is to say that I have a slug of fluid that's continuous, that's self-contained, that doesn't change. But in reality what's happening is the bit of the fluid <clears throat> that's, let's say, up here, Right, the bit of the fluid that's up here is actually being replaced at a greater rate uh, because of the velocity profile. You have this, this no slip condition near the wall, and then as you move away, the velocity is higher. So there's this kind of um, shearing or, or replacement of the fluid that's taking place. So some of the fluid that, that is hot or has is, is, uh, just gotten a little uh, warm is now replaced by cold fluid. And so that actually affects the, the heat transfer by uh, enhancing it. You're, you're conducting to something that's colder than it otherwise would have been. So in the end, we find that the net effect of our solution, our, our approximate solution, is that it underestimates the true heat transfer coefficient. So if you go back and like you use these approximate models and you sort of use it as a bounding case, realize that you're underestimating your heat transfer coefficient. And it's because we're, we're making this approximation that the fluid is basically a self-contained thing that just moves along. Okay, so all of this in mind, the correlation is more accurate if it's available for the geometry that you're looking at, if it's uh, within a valid non-dimensional parameter range. So you compute the Reynolds number, the Prandtl number, the Eckert number, and the correlation says, yeah, like you're in the valid range for what we used to develop the correlation in the first place. So it's more accurate then. It's also more accurate if it's properly formatted, uh, formulated. So what I mean is, let's say somebody went to the trouble of developing a correlation, but it's for a local heat transfer coefficient. If you want the, a the average, well, okay, it's, the local's not accurate for the average, so you have to like adjust it for that. Um, or say vice versa, they developed an average, you want the local, it's only, a it's only accurate under certain conditions. Constant flux, constant temperature, et cetera. So these are things that you have to think about. So you sit down and you kind of look at what's available in terms of correlations, and then you have to make a judgment. Am I better using a correlation or am I better using an approximate model? Almost always, hopefully, at least in this class, you should be more accurate using correlations that are already available. Um, as you get into real practice, that might change. 
Okay, so let's talk about uh, how you actually solve convection problems. Um, so I've out outlined kind of five steps here. Uh, these follow from the discussion in the book, so you could read more about this in the book if you're curious. It's a little bit, um, I don't know, I guess the discussion in the book's a little tedious, so I'm trying to kind of hit the highlights here. Uh, so forgive me if we go through it a little fast, but I think, if, again, if you're interested in the classification and, and some of that stuff, you can maybe look at the book. Okay, the things that we need to think about. Uh, when we're, let me just blow this up a little bit. So the methodology we need to think about when we're solving convection problems. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna understand the flow situation and geometry. So what, what do I mean? Well, actually, well, let me just read through these and then we'll go through them in detail. So understand the situation geometry. Uh, then we evaluate fluid properties, that's step two. Step three, identify a correlation that fits. Uh, step four, evaluate the correlation using the non-dimensional parameters. Step five, compute the dimensional result. Like you're gonna take your new salt number and make it into a heat transfer coefficient, for example. Okay, so I said we'd talk in detail, let's do that. Okay, step one. So methodology for solving convection problems, understand the flow situation and geometry. Um, so first of all, like what, what sort of flow situations or flow geometries do we need to think about? Well, there's these sort of categories we can put the problem in. So we could say, my flow is internal. External. Uh, internal versus external. So what is an example of external flow? Well, it would be like, you know, wind blowing over this table right here. What would be an example of internal flow? Internal flow would be air coming out of the duct into the room, right, or before it comes out of the duct. But what actually makes it internal versus external? Um, well, let's say we have a duct like this. In a duct and you have uh, two surfaces where the fluid is interacting, the boundary layer grows like this. The boundary layer grows also from the other side. At some point, if those boundary layers meet, right, the boundary layers are meeting here, this is internal flow. So internal flow is when boundary layer growth is constrained by the existence of another boundary layer or the existence of some other geometry. So there's different correlations depending on that case, external versus internal. By the way, um, even though I have a duct, if I considered only what's happening here before the boundary layers merge, that's still external flow, right? So even though you're inside the duct, the boundary layers have not yet met, so you'd still use an external flow correlation, right? So that's consideration number one. Um, consideration number two, is this forced uh, or natural? Um, so these are things we're gonna talk about more, right? We're gonna talk more about internal flow, a lot more about internal flow. We're gonna talk about natural convection. But just for now, all you need to know is uh, what would be an example of natural convection? Let's say I have a vertical wall, and that vertical wall is hot. Uh, it's hotter than the air around it. Right next to the wall, you're gonna get some like low density region forming. That low density region um, is going to uh, cause the air to rise. Right, so you start getting these natural currents that form that cause vertical, uh, basically cause vertical velocity. Um, and there's convection associated with that, right? There's, there's a convection correlation that goes with understanding the difference in buoyancy forces and so on. So that would be uh, another consideration. Um, third consideration, are we worried about local uh, versus average? Right, you need to think about that. That's, uh, we've already talked about it. Are we uh, thinking about turbulent uh, versus laminar? Uh, that's gonna dictate the uh, correlation. The thing to point out here is you might not know, right? You might not know beforehand. Same as uh, the first one, internal versus external. You might not know, but as you start going through the analysis, you're gonna wanna have on hand your turbulent and your laminar correlation, and then depending on the situation, you apply one or the other, right? But you just need to realize that these things can happen. You don't wanna just completely neglect to, to account for the fact that flow could be turbulent and ignore that it's transitioned, and now you're using a laminar correlation way into the region that turbulent should be used, right? It's just sort of things to think about. A couple more here. Um, let's see, so the surface boundary condition. Uh, 
so surface, what I mean here is um, constant temperature versus uh, constant flux. So if I had held a surface uh, temperature constant versus uh, applying a constant flux, that would give different, um, that would give uh, different correlations. That question? Uh, this is a, an example of natural. Right, so you have, you have some wall here, and there's uh, a temperature, we'll call this Ts, and out here this is T infinity. So Ts being greater than T infinity causes lower density fluid right next to the surface, and then that's going to want to rise. Uh, okay. Uh, last thing here would be uh, geometry. Um, so for example, I have an external flat plate and it looks something like this. And I have flow going over it in this direction. That's one correlation. Well, what if I take that same plate and rotate it 90 degrees like this? Is it the same correlation? No, <laughs> right, it's a different correlation. Um, so you need to account for both the geometry and flow orientation with respect to the thing that you're trying to model. Okay, so all of this is like, you just, you have to sit down, kind of take stock of what you're seeing and uh, figure out, okay, this is the type of problem I'm, I'm trying to model. This is a, the thing I need to think about, uh, these things I need to think about when, when deciding on a classification. Okay, so let's say we do all that. Um, then there's some further steps that you're gonna take. Uh, step two is evaluating the fluid properties. Um, so unless it's otherwise uh, specified, you'd, you'd evaluate the fluid properties using the film temperature. Okay, so the film temperature, T film, is the average, uh, it's effectively the average temperature in the boundary layer. So it's gonna be, say, Ts plus T infinity divided by two. It's just your average temperature. Um, it's not actually exactly the average, but it's a good approximation. So we'd say Ts plus T infinity over two. If, uh, if the correlation is, um, says otherwise, like there's some natural convection correlations that'll say, don't evaluate at film temperature, um, evaluate at the ambient temperature, or evaluate at the surface temperature, um, then you would follow what the correlation says. Otherwise, use the film temperature. Uh, that, so the question is, what if the, the heat flux is constant and the surface temperature is changing. Um, in that case, the, the correlation would be for the constant heat flux, right? And, that, and that's like the key consideration there is uh, when you're applying a constant heat flux, uh, that what's happening right at the leading edge is very different than what's happening if you apply a constant temperature. So constant temperature, you are saying, I effectively have infinite heat transfer right at the leading edge. At the uh, constant heat flux case, you're limiting the heat flux, and so the, the surface temperature is, is much different than it would have otherwise been. So you get like a different rate of boundary layer growth in those two cases. So you would, you'd, follow the, you'd follow the constant heat flux case. Is there another question? Okay. Um, okay, so T film, do that. So then we identify the correlation. Just some places you can look. Um, so ease. Uh, textbook, uh, paper, like a journal paper. Um, let's say nothing exists and your boss is really uh, wanting you to, to be very precise. You can do your own experiment. So you might um, at some point want to set something up and do an experiment uh, yourself. Hopefully they give you a lot of money to do that. Um, let's see, your own experiment, uh, and if all those things fail, then you can use an approximate model. Right, you can say, I'm going to approximately model the boundary layer thickness and, and do it that way. All the others are usually better. I mean, you might want to do some combination, like let's say you have a correlation, but you also develop an approximate model. You maybe check both of them and see, see what's good. So. Um, for the homework, by the way, I'm telling you to use the approximate model just for your own sort of conceptual understanding. 
Okay, so we have uh, all this identified correlation. Now we need to evaluate. So what does it mean to evaluate a correlation? Well, it basically means you figure out the non-dimensional parameters, Reynolds number, Prandtl number, so on, uh, and then you plug them in. So um, we're going to compute Reynolds, say Reynolds at x, or Prandtl, or uh, Reynolds at L, or whatever the characteristic length is, maybe the Eckert number, et cetera, and then uh, plug those in. Uh, that might be something like just calling the ease function. It might just you know, be evaluating the expression you have. Um, some things to say here, actually, uh, make sure uh, local versus average. Right? Just make sure you're using the right one. That's really the most common mistake that people make. And then uh, the other thing is uh, use fluid properties. Fluid properties. So uh, I can't tell you the number of times that I've said there's a metal and then plug that into the correlation, right? That's, that's wrong. The fluid is the thing that matters in terms of the conduction here. Yeah. The question is, how do you know when to use local versus average? So it depends on the question you're trying to answer. All right, so if I say, uh, or if somebody says to you, I want to know the total amount of energy that's being lost from this surface to the environment. In that case, average is the right way to go, right? You don't care that locally cer certain is uh, more than somewhere else. You're just trying to compute the, the total amount. Um, if you say you want to know like the temperature of the surface at a given location, that had better be the local one because the temperature locally is going to depend on the local heat transfer coefficient. So it, it really has to boil down to the question that you're, you're asking. Any other questions on this? So it's sort of the overall methodology. OK. Uh, one last step here is computing the dimensional parameters. So comp uh, that just means you know, we're going to use these relationships. H bar is equal to uh, new salt bar times uh, K. Uh, let's see, over. L or whatever it is, I think I missed something there. Um, Q dot is, you know, for example, H bar, A S, T S minus T infinity. So you're, you're kind of taking the new salt number that you're evaluating and then going backward um, to, to get the dimensional value. For shear stress, that might be uh, tau is equal to C F times rho U infinity squared over two. Uh, and then remembering that force is equal to shear stress times AS. So it's just it's going back to something that's useful that's not dimensional. Um, OK, last thing I, I think I wanted to point out here is uh, we've talked a little bit about like the friction coefficient. Uh, I mentioned maybe once or twice the, the drag coefficient. And I just want to be clear like which, which of those is which. Um, so let's see. Uh, the friction coefficient is basically the, um, the force that's exerted on some surface uh, due to shear stress in the fluid, right? So this is taking a surface. You have a velocity boundary layer like this. Uh, this introduces a shear force at the surface, right, at y equals 0. So this shear at y equals 0. Um, there's a reaction force. Uh, from the plate here, F. Uh, so this is, this is the uh, friction coefficient. The drag coefficient is both shear and the pressure difference across an object. Um, so let's say we have some, some like uh, cylinder like this. And I have flow coming around here, like this. Right, there's a pressure difference between the leading, uh, the leading part of this geometry and the trailing part. That pressure difference, in addition to the, the friction, um, is important. So let's say like there's some kind of separation that's occurring back here due to turbulent flow. Right, that is, that's really uh, what's being captured in this uh, drag. So this would be C sub D. Right. In, the, in the limit that the flow is going really, really slow on the drag side, so we call that creeping flow, and there's no separation. 
then CD and CF become the same thing, right? CD would, would basically revert to just the shear of the fluid, 